Good morning, everybody. We're so excited that you're here with us today. Um, we're going to begin this session with um, a, what our work is going to be over the next several years. It's not just about performance-based assessments. And we've done a lot of work this past year working with teachers on performance-based assessments. And what they learned through these sessions was that it cannot be just about the assessments. It has to be about the instruction that leads up to those ass assessments. And so this session that's going to kick off next year for our schools on August the 1st is about performance-based teaching and learning and assessments and how what we do in our classrooms every day affects student learning and student progress. And so, again, this is a kickoff for that. It's not just one session and then we don't look at performance-based teaching and learning again. All of the district collaboration days that we have next school year are all going to focus on performance-based teaching and learning and strategies that you will use in your classroom with performance-based teaching and learning. So this is really just an overview to talk with teachers and for everybody to understand what it's all about, what our expectations are, what we think assessments are going to look like, and how our instruction has to change to be able uh, to meet the expectations of those assessments so that you as teachers are able to use that in your classrooms to better enable our students to be prepared for that type of work. Okay, so we appreciate you being here today. We're excited that we have Kathy Matthews from Matthew, uh, from Matthew. Kathy Matthews from Metro Risa here to do our session. She did all of our training with teachers um, with performance-based assessments and teaching and learning uh, in 2013-14, and she's going to work with us again uh, in 2014-15. So we're excited that she's here to be able to lead us through this overview of the work that we're going to do. Okay, thank you. Fun, we're going to be videotaped. Yes. <laughs> Are you ready back there? Okay, I want to start this morning um, by saying welcome and happy summer. Uh, I know it's always exciting when you get those kids out the door that last day and can start your um, summer vacation. Uh, I know that most of the summers as a teacher I worked, so I'm sure many of you are doing the same thing, whether it's as a parent or as um, in an actual job. So, um, but I'm glad you're here and I'm looking forward to the work today. We are going to be looking at the content today from two different perspectives. The first is as a participant. So we're going to actually go through this content today as if we were participating in the District Collaboration Day. And then the second way is as a facilitator because you will be facilitating this work with your colleagues. So we're going to have some conversations about what good facilitators do and how you can support participants with really understanding and getting to the heart of what we're trying to uh, get across in this district collaboration day. I want you to know, first of all, before I pull up the PowerPoint and get started, all of this information, everything you will need to facilitate this is in its learning. And I'm going to walk right over here and show you exactly what's in there. If you go into the uh, Forsyth County Schools August 1st District Collaboration Day folder, there, the first thing you'll see is the PowerPoint. And then you have several different video clips that you'll be using during that session that are, are right there. You just have to click on them and they go straight to the video. You also have um, all of the activities and you also have a facilitator's guide. Now the facilitator's guide um, gives you kind of step-by-step -step directions for how to facilitate this work. And that's going to be a useful tool for you to review right before you're doing this. Um, it tells you what materials you'll need. It tells you kind of what you will teach. And then it gives you the task. And it even gives you sample answers. So you kind of have the answer sheet um, before you go into this work. And I'll show you that um, as we get into the work today. But I wanted you to know where everything was. It's right there for you to, to access in its learning. And you'll just need to have this up when you begin your district collaboration day work. Okay? So that's all right there. Let me go over here and um, put the PowerPoint up.
One of the things that I have really enjoyed about working with Forsyth County Schools is your, your district staff is really all about you and the kids in this district. They want to make things clear to you. They want to make sure that you have really clear expectations and that you know exactly what is coming down the pike because there's a lot of things coming down the pike. And so we struggled a lot to decide what are we really going to call this district collaboration day because we've been doing lots and lots of work around performance based assessment. But as Fonda said earlier, we really started to notice that it was more about the teaching and learning in the classroom. And so we titled this performance based teaching. That's the work of the teacher. And then the assessment is actually the student evidence of learning. And so we decided on that title so that we had a balance between instruction and assessment. I know sometimes it feel, feels like all we do is assess. And we want to really focus on the good instruction that's going on in the classroom so that the evidence of learning is just natural as a result of that instruction. As a, as a beginning piece of this work, there is actually going to be a video, so you don't even have to begin the work with, with your group. There's going to be a video, and it's going to be a, a different video. It's going to be a board member who's going to be doing this video to kind of set the vision for all of the participants. This is where we're going. In your facilitator's guide, you actually have the content, exactly what's being said in that video, so you can kind of be aware of the, what this board member is going to say in that video. So you'll begin the session by telling them the title of the session and then letting them see the video to hear from the district, this is where we're going with performance-based teaching and student evidence of learning over the course of the year. And it also will set the learning targets. Once the video is over, you will have the DCD learning targets up here. And basically, you're just going to review this with the group. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that right now with you as if you were participants. There are three big targets that we're focusing on over the course of this day. The first one is we want to make explicit connections to performance-based instruction in the classroom, and teacher keys and our learner pro profile in Forsyth County Schools. It sometimes feels like we're balancing all kinds of plates. You know, we're, we have all these things that we're trying to do. We've got, you know, teacher keys, leader keys, CCRPI, and the list goes on and on and on. And so what we want to do is make sure that everybody understands that if you engage in performance-based teaching activities in your classroom, you're going to meet the expectations of the teacher keys. And if you engage in that type of instruction, your students will meet the expectations in the learner profile. And we are going to work very, very hard today to, to develop a common district language. So we're all talking the same language. So when we talk about uh, teacher keys, we're using the same language. When we talk about differentiation, we're using a common language. So most of the work at the beginning is really to build that common language and make connections between all those spinning plates. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to basically identify the characteristics of what does it look like in a classroom when it's student-centered and it's performance-based. Everything that we have in our standards and our expectations, those are performance standards. So we have to make sure that our classrooms focus on student performance and get kids engaged in performances. So we'll, we'll identify what that's going to look like. We'll see it in videos. We'll talk about the characteristics and kind of qualify what a good student-centered performance-based learning environment actually looks like. And then the last thing we want to do is we want to reflect on our own practice. What do we do well as it relates to that student-centered performance-based learning environment? And what are some of our next ste steps for making sure that we're doing that to prepare students for those assessments that will be ultimately performance-based? Okay, now I'm going to step out. Facilitator, basically you're just going to share the targets with the participants and expound on them a little bit. I know most people can't stand for somebody to read the PowerPoint to them. And so you noticed I, I did connect to the PowerPoint, but I also added some other things. And I think that's what you have to do when you're facilitating this work. Help them understand why we're doing the work we're doing today. It's just like in a classroom when you set targets for kids. You want to do that for, your, um, for the adults. Are there questions so far? Pretty easy, huh? 
All right, so we're going to start with this learning target. We're going to start to make those connections between all those spinning plates, especially TEKS and our learner profile in Forsyth County, and performance-based instruction, and we're going to build a common language. So this is our focus for right now. And these are six, is that six, two, four, six, seven? These are seven um, basically vocabulary words that um, your district identified to say these are the things that we need to have a common language about. We need to understand what do these words mean? What does it look like in practice? And um, so we've, we've identified these and what we're going to do is we're going to work as groups to build a common language around these, these terms. So how many of you have done a Freyer model? Okay, Freyer model is a great way to your voc of vocabulary. And so what I have here is a model. And what you're going to do as a facilitator is you're going to model the Freyer model for your groups and then you're going to engage them in doing the Freyer model around one of those other key terms. Okay, so what you do in the Freyer model is in the center is the key term. And I've done teacher keys for you. The first thing that you do is you have to come up with a definition, and you want to come up with that definition in your own words. What I find is that the definition is a lot more difficult than all these other pieces. So sometimes it's easier if you move on over to something else like characteristics, and that helps you formulate your definition. So one of the things we know about teacher keys is it's a comprehensive system. It is looking at not only classroom observations and your performance in the classroom, it's also looking at the results that you're getting for students. It's also looking at student surveys and how they perceive what's going on in the classroom. So it's a comprehensive system and it's based on standards. The teacher keys, when, when a principal or assistant principal comes into your classroom to observe you, they're going to be looking for evidence of specific standards. And there are 10 standards in the teacher keys. Um, another word to describe it is that it's a professional. It's about professional growth. Um, it is not just, yes, you did it or no, you didn't. It's, you did it at this level, and here's how you could improve the quality of what you're doing. So it kind of shifts our thinking about how evaluation looks in the, in the classroom. It's multi-layered, and it's more rigorous. When you think about um, our current evaluation, statewide evaluation instrument, it's really just a yes or a no, satisfactory or needs improvement. And this really looks at, at um, your growth teacher as a progression. Some examples of the standards are content knowledge, planning, differentiation, assessment, um, research-based practices is one of those standards. Non-examples would be the GTEP. That, that is not, GTEP is completely different from teacher keys. And a non-example is um, PAC, and that's what you currently use in Forsyth County. Okay, so all of those things help us to build our definition. And the definition, again, in your own words, teacher keys is a common evaluation system. Uh, that means it's used across the state for teachers based on a common definition of teacher effectiveness. And the teacher effectiveness is built through those 10 standards. Okay? So that's an example of the Freyer model. And now what I want you to do is I want you to engage in this work around another one of those key terms. In your handout packet, you actually have a list of those key terms. And you're going to choose at your table one word that you want to uh, define using the Freyer model. And what you're going to do is you're going to complete a Freyer model on this post-it paper that's on the end of your table. And in the center, you're going to put the word that you chose to define. And then you're going to do those four different pieces in your groups. When you're finished, you're going to hang your posters over there on the wall, and then we're going to take a gallery walk. I'm going to step out for a minute and talk to you as facilitators. You will want to, based on the size of your group, go ahead and assign these words so that we're getting every one of those words defined. Um, we did teacher keys together, so there's six other words that you want to assign to different groups, just to make sure that we're, we're seeing the definitions of all seven of those words. Does that make sense? Are there questions? Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to take a few minutes and I want you to actually engage in this work 
so that you kind of feel what it feels like to be a participant, because that might raise questions or help you understand how you might better facilitate this work. Okay? So choose one word and complete the Freyer model on that chart paper. Really do it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring you back together and um, I want to talk to you now as facilitators. You just engaged in the work as if you were participants. Now as facilitators, what did you notice that I did while you were engaged in the work? Ask questions. And the purpose of the questions is not to, not to say this is right or this is wrong, but the purpose is to have the group dig deeper into their conversations. The purpose of this activity is to build common language. And if we want to build that common language, we've got to have conversations until we come to consensus. And so I ask kind of probing questions to get you to dig a little bit deeper into why you put something somewhere. Uh, anything else I did as a facilitator? You were walking around, checking in, listening in to the groups. So I walked around and checked in and listened to the groups. And I did that very intentionally. And it's what good teachers do. You do this in your classroom. You're just checking in to see, do, does everybody understand what they're putting together? So you'll do that too as a facilitator. And just nudge when you find it, it useful to nudge. Um, and try to find something on there that's kind of a controversial thing, something that will make them think a little bit deeper about the content. All right, so I'm going to bring you back as participants, and this is what we did. What I'd like you to do right now is I'd like you to look at the charts over here. We're not going to stand up and take a gallery walk, um, but that's what you'll do with your groups is you'll allow them some time to walk around and see what others put. And what I want us to do is I want us to think about this Freyer model and what are some of the commonalities. The two words that we defined were culminating task and formative assessment. What are some of the commonalities between those two that you see up there? And in what ways are those terms different? So just think through that for just a minute. Take a look at what was put up there. It's hard to see the green. Okay, I want to repeat that. What she said was that the culminating task is, focus, is actually looking at a, a range of skills and standards, whereas formative assessment is looking at those individual pieces over time before they get to the culminating task. What else? So everything that we are formatively assessing here leads us to this culminating task, absolutely. So these are very connected. We have to have both in a performance-based classroom. We've got to know where our students are so that we can plan good instruction so that they show evidence of learning on that culminating task. Anything else you want to add to that? So what I'm going to rephrase that and say that formative is, it can be formal or informal. And I, what I did was formative assessment. I was walking around and checking your progress. When we get to a culminating task, we may have a rubric to assess it. It's much more of a formal setting where they're actually going to produce a product or a performance that we assess using that rubric. Great. So you see the connections between these terms. And when you look at all seven with your groups that you're working with, you want to try to make connections between all seven because they are all connected. If we see every single one of those terms as an individual thing that we have to do in our classroom and don't see the connections, then it's going to feel like we're overwhelmed. I mean, I know that teachers always feel oh, another thing to do. Am I right? So we want to make those connections so you see that the formative assessment leads to the culminating task. And if you're doing both of those things, you're meeting expectations on the teacher keys. So it's, it, they're not all separate things. They work all together. All right, so that's the first task. That's the first target. What questions do you have as facilitators? Like for each group to go up and kind of present and clarify and talk through, or? 
Okay, so the question was, when we do the gallery walk, which is on this task page, it says take a gallery walk. It is up to you as facilitators. If you feel like your group needs to actually present out so that you can get a clear picture of each one of those words, that is fine. Um, and I think you might get a better response to that reflection if you have them share what they said. But don't, don't have them read them. Have them kind of summarize the key thoughts that came out as a result of the conversation. Does that make sense? But I do think it would be a good idea to hear from each group so that you can kind of get a feel for what those seven words do have in common before you debrief the task. Okay, any other questions? All right, so that's the first target. And that moves us up, once we've done this task reflection, that moves us up to the next two learning targets. And our work now is going to focus on making sure that we all have a really good picture of what does a, a student-centered performance-based classroom look like. We hear that all the time, and I know one of the things I hear from teachers when I work with them is, can you just tell me what that looks like? Just show me what that looks like in practice, and I can replicate it. But, you know, just hearing about it is not enough. So we're going to actually see those, see some performance-based classrooms in action to help us identify those characteristics. And then as, as teachers, we're going to reflect on what do we do well and what could we do to create a, a, a better student-centered performance-based learning environment. All right, so I want to talk through this so that you understand where this came from. There are direct connections between performance-based instruction and performance-based assessment. And it's, it's really important that when we are in a student-centered performance-based classroom, that we are focused on the standards. Um, I, I tell the groups that I work with, for those of you who were a part of the performance-based assessment group, if I ask a question and you don't know the answer, just say standards, because more than likely that's going to be the answer. Um, part of our problem is we haven't focused on the right targets. If we want students to show evidence of learning, we have to focus on the right targets. And so we know that our performance standards, whether it's GPS, CCGPS, whatever the standards are, they set the expectations for us as teachers and for our students as learners. They say this is what students should know, understand, and be able to do. The assessments provide evidence that students actually did master those expectations. So if, if everything is focused on those, then teaching and learning in the classroom has to mirror the expectations of those standards, and it has to mirror the evidence of learning required by the assessments. If students are going to be required to perform on, a, on an assessment, then we have to give them chances to perform in the classroom. When I was going through school, my teacher talked from bell to bell. And maybe I'd do a couple of problems on a worksheet. But my teacher was doing most of the work. What we've got to do is if we're asking kids to perform, we've got to let them have chances to practice. And so, but everything has to be connected to the expectations of the standards. So what that implies is that assessment does matter. And, you know, for those of you who know Beth Kiefer, she's in the assessment division at Forsyth County Schools, but her focus and what she wants you to focus on is the teaching and learning. Assessments will fall into place if we teach and engage students in performances that match the expectations of the standards. So assessment does matter, but we've got to change the way we teach in the classroom in order to get kids engaged in the expectations of those standards to help them meet them. So there are basically six implications. This is what this means for us as educators. Six things that we ought to see students doing. Every single one of these uh, implications begins with what word? students. We have to shift our focus from what the teacher does to what the student does. So the first one is that students should be engaged in authentic tasks that require them to show mastery of the standards. It's always the standards. So whatever work they're doing 
they should be able to make the connection between some expectation or some standard. They know the expectations and they can articulate the expectations. When I was going through school, I knew what we were doing, but I had no clue why. I knew that I had to, in geometry, do a proof, but I had no idea why I was doing that proof. It, it didn't make any sense to me. We've got to articulate those expectations to students so that they can say those back to us. In a performance-based classroom, students ought to be receiving feedback about how they're, how they're coming towards meeting that, that expectation. And they ought to make revisions to that work based on that feedback. That's another thing I never had the opportunity to do. I remember in my English language arts classrooms when I did a paper, it came back with two numbers on it, content and grammar and conventions. Did y'all have that? And it had 11 billion red marks all over it. All over it. And I was never able to make revisions. That was just my grade. We have to give students the chance over time to practice, get feedback, make changes, so that when we get to that final assessment, whether it's the culminating task or a state high stakes assessment, that they will be successful. We need to get students self-assessing and setting goals. I can't self-assess and set goals if I don't know the target. I have to know what I'm aiming for, and then I can say, you know what, I'm not quite there, and here's what I could do to get there. And then we want students to defend and justify their work and how it meets the expectations. And we're going to see all of these things in action. So what I want you to do is I want you to get out the, the handout that is called Six Implications. And you have those six implications on one side and then some blank space on the other side. And what we're going to do right now is we're actually going to watch a video and we're going to watch a mathematics teacher um, who is basically allowing her students to engage in all six of those implications over the course of this lesson. So what you're going to do is you're going to use that handout to kind of take notes while you're watching the video and see what does she do to get kids engaged in authentic tasks? What is she doing to um, allow students a chance to get feedback and revise their work? So you're looking for those six implications in this video. Now the first video we're going to watch is a math video. It, you need to tell participants that the reason we're watching a math video is so that everybody in Forsyth County sees one video and sees the exact same things and has the exact same conversations. Then we're going to have an opportunity to, to view another video that is much more content grade level specific. Okay, So we're doing this one, remember part of our work is to build a common language. So the common video is to build common language. One thing you're going to fight, and I, I fight it all the time, is a lot of teachers who don't teach math are going to say, mm, this doesn't apply to me. It does apply to, to everybody. Because the practices that she's engaging her kids in, you can do this with any content area. You will need to say that before you watch this video, because you'll have people who are going to look at you like, why are we watching a math video? Make it very clear that this is about what the teacher and students are doing, not about the content. I don't care if any of you learn anything about uh, calculating the area of composite figures. That's not our purpose. We are focusing on what teacher does and student does. Okay, students do. All right, I'm going to walk over here and get the video started. We're going to watch the opening first, and you're going to take notes. Then we'll watch the work session. Then we'll watch the closing. Okay, here we go. Talked about 
Okay, the first, if you look on this, it's learning. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to click video 2513. That's the opening. Once you click it, you click this link and it will come straight up. Number of shapes you see. So here we see a composite figure with two or more shapes. Thank you so much. And she subdivided her figure into what? Three parts. Is there another way we can sub? Oh, all right then. Yes, yes sir. square 
your units within. All right. Now today for your lesson. Today, remember our standard is we're going to try to calculate, not we try, we will calculate the area of composite figures based upon the area of the figures we talked about today. Now in your work, you need to make sure you use your formulas correctly. You use your units correctly when you're finding the area. You defend your work and you show your work. All right, let's. Okay, so you've seen now just the opening. Now what I'd like you to do is I want you to talk with your groups about what did you see in that opening that is connected to those six implications. You may not have seen all of them in the opening, but what did you see that that teacher did connected to those six implications? Talk about that in your groups. All right, I'm going to pull you back together, and I want us to debrief together the conversations you just had. Now, think about how did what she did connect to those six implications, because that's what we're really trying to do. So what were some of the things you noticed that she did to connect to those six implications? So she started with their background knowledge to build up to something that's going to be more difficult. What, what does, how does that connect to those implications? What is... They, they were able to say where they were going. They will, were able to articulate their target. They knew that if they knew the area, how to calculate the area of these simple shapes, they can apply that to something that's more difficult. So she's preparing them to use what they know and to set goals to move further. What else did she do well? She stated the, the objective multiple times. You know, I think we, we got into this habit where we said, okay, let's post the standard, everybody. And everybody started posting the standard so that when the principal came in, he'd say, okay, standard post, check. And really, the purpose of posting the standard is so that kids know their target. That's that second uh, implication, that they can articulate where they're going. And she did that over and over and brought that, them back to that vocabulary multiple times. So that by the time they started their work, today we're going to try to, no, not we're going to try to, we are going to calculate the area of composite figures. And so they knew where they were going. What else? She gave feedback so they could modify their answers. How did she give them feedback? She said she gave them feedback so they could modify their answers. How did she do that? She used, yeah, she is a masterful questioner. What you will see during this work session, she is so good at asking the right questions. And that's a way of giving feedback. And she requires those students to use what kind of language? The, the math vocabulary, the language of that subject. She didn't say one long, when he said one long one, one short one, one long one, she said, well, what are those figures? She didn't say, what are those shapes? She said, what are those figures? She's lifting the level of their vocabulary to the language and the standards. Do those students know their target? And that's what good performance-based performance -based teaching and learning is founded on. If kids don't know their target, the rest of it doesn't matter. We've got to make sure they understand their target. So now we're going to watch the second portion, where she engages them in their performance task. It's actually a learning task, 
And a learning task is something that builds up to that culminating task. But I want you to watch in particular how she's grouped the students. I want you to watch the, the, um, how she's scaffolded the tasks. Look very intentionally for, um, look at their handouts so you can see how the task is scaffold, scaffolded. And I want you to watch for those six implications. You're going to see more of those implications as we engage in the next portion of the video. Okay? So on its learning, it is 518 to 1406. You'll click that second one. And then click the link. Let's get work. Sure about the rate table because it's too many zeros. I don't like zeros. 
Okay, so talk about what you just saw in that portion and how it connects to those implications with your group. So what are some of your thoughts about what you saw in, in that portion of the, the lesson? Very stupid. They did most of the talk. The sp teacher to be quiet. Look at me. <laughs> she just said it's hard for a teacher to be quiet and look at me. I wanted to tell you exactly what you were going to say. The kids did most of the talking. And so the people who are doing the talking are the ones who are doing the learning. And, and that's why you want to, when you're facilitating this work, let, let your groups have that conversation before you debrief the video because it's real important for them to, to see, talk about what they saw and how it connected to those implications. What else did you notice she did? They don't make the connections. One of the groups realized that they had, they had to have made a mistake because when they were subtracting, when they had to subtract that 2,500 square meters, there, there wasn't enough. Yeah. So they, it helped them also realize that, oh, well, I must have made a mistake. So, so, so two big points that came from what you just said. The first thing is that task was deliberately and intentionally scaffolded for the kids to build from prior knowledge, starting with a rectangle, something that they would get some success from. And, and then that every problem went back to that and added a little bit more difficulty, which allowed them to almost self-monitor for mis mistakes. So I see, I, I, if I can't do this section, I might have made a calculation error. So she's giving them those scaffolds to help them meet the expectations. Now, um, what else did you notice? Exactly. So they had to draw, she required them to draw in that square that was taken out of that piece of land. And what does that connect to on those implications? Yeah, defend and justify their work. Um, knowing that that's a square is critical to doing that problem successfully. And you'll notice in the ending where some of the students actually just subtracted the 50 um, from the rectangle and tried to do area of a rectangle. Well, it, that completely messes up the whole problem. She wants them to discover those things. She wants them to see their problems. What do you? What did she do really well with that small group? Yes. She is. She was. She guided them and asked the right questions to nudge them just a little bit further in their understanding and gave them. You know responsibility for each other. You know, that, that's all about that self-assessment and setting goals. Well, what about your partner? How, how are you pro proceeding towards, progressing towards these goals? You need to be constantly assessing that as you're engaged in the work. 
She is just, she really is a master. Do you think she wanted to correct the mistake? Oh, gosh, you know she wanted to correct the mistake. It is so difficult not to take the pencil out of their hand and do it for them and show them how they made the mistake. But what you see in the closing in just a few minutes is you're going to see how that mistake probably will never be made by those two again because of the comment that the young man makes in the closing. Listen for it. He makes a comment that lets you know that he gets it. He knows that if you make one calculation error, it can mess up the whole thing. So she let them discover that rather than her telling them that's wrong. And you'll see how they discover it. Anything else about that particular portion? The way she parted the girl that was overconfident, just a little bit made a mistake. He was very quiet. I don't remember, did he show his work as much as she did? Like maybe it might have been a good model of how to really write everything down. Yes. She did intentionally and deliberately group those students. She sat down with those two very intentionally and deliberately because she knew that they were going to need those questions to help them through. But then you had that other group that was working independently. Did you notice that one group had a lot of space and that group did not? So that's another little scaffold that she's given to somebody so it doesn't look so overwhelming when you're looking at that page and see five problems and see how difficult it's going to get. So she grouped those folks very deliberately and probably the groups don't stay the same. We don't have evidence of that, but they probably don't stay the same. She probably moves them based on what she's trying to, to teach. All right, so let's watch. The, go ahead. What does that, you, she said that the conversation was very focused and they knew how to talk about the work. What did the teacher do to create that, that expectation? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and I think it, what you're saying is the power of a model, I don't think we know how powerful it is. Everything we do in a classroom, they're going to mimic. And so, you know, your facial expression, your language that you use, they're going to mimic that language. And so because she's using academic vocabulary, she's, she's requiring them to think and show their work, show their work, show their work. She says that over and over again so that it becomes ingrained. It's a part of, of the way that they engage in work. All right, let's watch the closing and again, keep looking for those implications because you're going to see a heavy focus on one in particular. So it's uh, video 1847 to end. About the gauge and some sharing. Number three, number three. All right, now we're going to listen and then we're going to talk about whether we agree or disagree. Uh, number three, that should be the same number two, but we took 50 away from our um, height. Look back at your work also. 
to see we may disagree or not, not disagree with the second method. You know what it subtract 50 meters side square from 195,000 meters square. That would be the total of 192,500 meters square. Any questions? Do we agree or disagree? Agree. What do we agree with though? The answer. The answer. The solution. Let's look at the process of both of them. All right? Let's look at the first one. You, did, you found the area of this rectangle right here. Now, do we agree with that? No. This is where they found the area of, or what they found the area of. All right, share that out loud. Who can hear you? That's not a rectangle, but it can't be the entire way. So if you took that piece away, it could have to go up and over it because you cut out. Did we hear that? Do we have any questions about what was just shared? Now, when we come back to problem number three, what was the first step again? Find the area of that square of, the square of, the of this cut out piece. So we had to find the area of this piece right here, and he found it right there. And then we knew that we could do what? Subtract the area, the area of the square total area. Of the area of the we can subtract the area of this square from the total area. And where would that solution come from? Number what? Number two. So we had to look back at question number two. But did you have to go back to question number two? No, you could have calculated it over again. Any questions about number three? Did we clarify everything? Yeah. All right, number four. We found the whole thing which was seven hundred and fifty because we had to take the square piece off. And we found seven hundred and fifty. Five hundred was right here plus three hundred, which was eight hundred, and took the piece off, which was seven hundred and fifty. Any questions? So we agree with that. All right, number five. I think that was the big discussion. Okay, we want to give a clap before we see it. All right. Boy. All right, and they're standing up. Okay, giving fives to each other. This is going to be good. The farmer is going to be back on from. The farmer gets her to shade area. How much land does the dog receive? We relate this question back to question four. And it says, the whole figure equals 305,000 meters square. The two triangles together equals 90,000 90, meters square. If you subtract the total of the whole figure from the two triangles, you'll get 215,000 meters square. The dollar receives 215,000 meters square of land for her own. But before we do all this clapping, do we agree, though?
Now, what we want to do is move back over our work, make any changes, uh, corrections based upon the closing, and let's reflect for a moment. Remember what our task was today, what our standard was. What do we need to do today? Okay, so talk with your groups about what you saw in the closing that connected to those six implications. Had it, had it been a culminating task, yeah. And let's ask that question for the whole group. Okay, I'm going to bring you back together, and um, I want to hear some of your thoughts and then give you your uh, a little cheat sheet. Um, what were some of your thoughts about the closing that, that really you thought encapsulated those six implications? What did she do and what did the students do? 